I'm Sai. Welcome to Ace Podcast Nation. We've got podcast interviews and content on pretty much every subject you could think of. Football, mental health, MMA, boxing, uh, films and TV, conspiracy theories. We've also got a uh, unique series which we uh, create ourselves, which is My Story is one of them, where we take our guests through their career, their life, and they share memories and anecdotes as we go along. Uh, as we record this is Sunday, so I've just released or just about to release uh, the episode with former Wales international Reese Weston, which was a, a really good show. Of all the 160 shows I've done, it's one of my favourite ones to record, which says a lot because it's very rarely I feel like I haven't enjoyed them. Uh, episode one of our series was with uh, former England cricketer Chris Lewis, who's been controversial at time times. He talked uh, everything from his his career, his upbringing and also his uh, stint in jail. We've got an episode of that coming up as well with Robbie Regan, and uh, I'm in talks to speak to the actor who plays Lofty from EastEnders for that. And of course, we have our unscripted, uncensored series where that is literally uh, just, I do no research, no questions. All of the talking points, all the questions are set by the people, by the viewers, and uh, it always makes for an interesting show. We've had all sorts of people on there. We've had... Uh, We've had fighters like UFC's Jack Shaw, UFC's Brett Johns, uh, Modestus Bukakash. Uh, we've also had Cage Warriors stars, Paddy Pimblett, uh, Oban Elliott. Who else have we had? Rodri Giggs. Uh, loads of them. Too many for me to remember off the top of my head, that's for sure. And uh, there's plenty more to come. Gavin Gwynn as well, Welsh boxer, and Cody Davis. Loads of them. And of course, can't forget uh, Shed Seven lead singer Rick Witter as well as UK Indie Band The Crooks. So you can check out all those shows, the various uh, subjects at youtube.com slash acepodcastnation. If you can subscribe and click the link, that's the best way to support the channel and the podcast, and you'll find all 160 shows plus there. And, of course, uh, the audio versions are all your usual podcasting and radio apps, iHeartRadio, Apple Apple Radio or Apple Podcasts, I think it's called now, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, all those good stuff. Today, we're going to talk a bit, a bit of everything, really. Um, but just before I do introduce my guest, I just wanted to say uh, every Monday, 7.30, we do a live football show. It's the Andy Campbell Show. It's live on Facebook, YouTube. Hopefully, as this goes out, we'll have also added Periscope to that still working on that uh, that's where myself and former Cardiff City Middlesbrough striker Andy Campbell talk the latest football news break down the championship action normally but uh, we're doing some retro reviews at the moment and uh, of course last week Mr Kevin McNaughton stepped in for uh, Andy Campbell so uh, that was a, a fun show no doubt so my guest today is uh, author ex-pub landlord promoter man of many trades and, uh, of course, Cardiff City fan, Mr. Anthony Rivers. Welcome, my friend. How are you? Hiya, Simon. How are you? Thanks for the invite. And well, before I go on, um, congratulations on the show because uh, it's going from strength to strength. I've been uh, following it from um, its early genesis. But, you know, we, I know we've been speaking for a while to get me on. But <laughs> things have gone away. But 160 shows, that's uh, fantastic, mate. Long may it continue. Cheers, mate. I appreciate that. I know that gets... Uh... It's weird because, like, when I started it, I started it with a uh, my my Galaxy S7 on a tripod and a tripod with some headphones. And then I don't I, know what you're talking. I don't know what you're talking about, but carry on. I know I, I'm a luddite when it comes to uh, yeah technology. You said, didn't you? But <laughs> well, basically, yeah. I started with my phone and a set of head headphones like this. Then I kind of graduated. So, like, the first few shows, the, the quality's all right. Like, but you can see as the shows go on, it gets better. So, obviously. I started with that. Then I got like a microphone to plug into my phone, and then around November time, I got a proper HD camera and got lighting and a green screen behind me, which has got a flag on it at the moment. And it's just it is growing, and and more than that, it's like the equipment obviously is getting better as we go along and we get bigger. But you know, we got I think coming up to nine thousand followers on Facebook and subscribers. That's fantastic. Are, creeping up towards that thousand mark on youtube that's been the challenge because obviously you know that's the one that i want to try and get above a thousand and get as high as possible really um and we're creeping up though mate it's creeping up i've had a few, you well, know, a few more that, that's that's great numbers on uh, on your facebook page i did notice that the other day it was uh eight nine thousand which uh after a year it, it, it is brilliant 
it's wild to me. To me, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to me. Like because I said, I say to my missus all the time, like why, why are people interested in you know listening to me speak? Like I'm not naive enough to think that they're tuning in, you know, for me. They're tuning yeah, in yeah. for the guests. So obviously, well, a lot had, of that. You've had some. To- you've had some top quality guests. You know, Kev McNaughton next week. But now you've had yeah, to. You have to scrape the barrel tonight, don't you? A little bit. No, yeah, well. <laughs> well, no, I admit it. Everyone's got a story to tell, you know. And um, yeah, yeah. like you've got, yeah. you have got an interesting story to tell. Like when you know, we'll get into it all. Like it'll go from some things, which maybe people, like some people, won't they won't appeal to. But then, yeah, as yeah. you know, as you've got as you've got older and you've gone into different different things and different businesses, there's you've got many many a story to tell. Well, I have been called a social. Uh, um uh social media influencer you know as i uh, yeah well. there you go there you go i don't <laughs> think is mate i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing no I know. That, that's the only thing no yeah yeah it's, so, it's a lot um, of fun i i i probably i started on facebook and I moved on to twitter and then when i was i i come back to it but i uh, i had a little clothes shop in Merthyr for a few years where um vintage I, I i love i love all the special vintage you know from uh, uh going back probably um you know the late 70s through to i think they call vintage now pre-96 which uh which is the uh the term but a lot of people use use it later but yeah. I, I i set up a page then on instagram in my shop was called the archives uh 0927 um uh, yeah, a couple of connotations there, but um, yeah, but I like I finished with the football violence side of things a long time ago. I'll explain that, but um, I I still like to keep uh, you know abreast of um, uh, of the culture, shall we say? And it's it, it it's died a little bit in 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 some terms, but uh, there's still there's still enough people who uh, who treasure what uh, w- what is represented. Oh yeah, definitely. I um, well, we we'll, obviously we'll get into that sort of side of it, but like me and you are quite similar in the way that we both love the the culture which goes with it, the clothes and the music and the yeah, the away days you? and the. I stop you. Know, well, the clothes you're talking about, the clothes you got. I see. Is that, is that an Ian Brown money T-shirt you got on with that? It is. Yeah. yeah it is. Yeah. My my eyesight's doing okay, but uh, yeah, very. Yeah. Nice. See, I got a. <laughs> it's one of my favourites. I um, I had one which was like one of the um i don't know i wouldn't say it was like from the original line of them but it was yeah. certainly from around that era like when they remember first the t-shirt them. remember the t-shirt there was um i'm sure he ian brown with a gun not very politically correct like but still he was ian brown with a gun and he had a co-op t-shirt on Can you remember that one i yeah, vaguely but, uh, yeah, rings a bell, yeah like. it, 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 I'm, I'm sure my buddy gareth hopkins had it but um yeah yeah i remember seeing it about well, yeah, I had obviously iconic in it from uh, yeah, the it's a classic, mate. Well, that's it. I um, I had one which was from around that era, like it had come out whenever they started selling them, and I treasured it. And um, I wore it so much to Barfly Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sunday night, three days in a row without going home for like a few years straight, more or less. <laughs> that it just ended, it just ended up with uh, yeah, yeah, you know, just the, rips the, the... and. The so I had to replace was, it basically. The nineties was an interesting and fast decade, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was. Uh, <laughs> Seen them all. From what from what I can remember of it, it was pretty good. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, Mo- yeah. moving into the noughties as well. Huh? Yeah, the early uh, early early noughties, but certainly that. That's all I'll say about that, because uh, my kids watch some of these shows, so I got to be careful. So what I say, ghost, ghost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, discretion is my middle name. Well, but um, yes, yeah. Well, obviously. We're going through some uh, uh, some bizarre times, some anxious times. Um, how, how are you and your family? Oh, I'll be all right. Like it's it's a weird one. Isn't it? It's so different to anything which has ever happened. It's so unprecedented. Like I think, like when we talked off air the other day, I um, my younger one, I feel a bit for because he's eleven. He's in the last year of primary school. He went to school. On the last Friday, they went in. Yeah. Um, he thought he thought he was having like an extended Easter holiday, and they basically said, "You probably ain't coming back. You're probably going to just go to high school in September." And I think that kind of hit him with 
all sorts of emotions from you know the sadness of not being able to say goodbye to his friends and his teachers Definitely. and that side of it but also the anxious anxiety of knowing he's got to go to high school the next time he goes to school or potentially got to go to high school the next time he goes into school which is it's difficult for an 11 year old to process I mean, it's, it's difficult for us to process some of the stuff which is going on it's uh, so much of a culture shock isn't it from from a to z they oh, yeah. um like you said the um the um, the pupils now who, who can't even set their exams you know to some of them it'll probably be uh uh less obviously less stressful but like you said there's there's that culture change where they possibly won't even see their teachers again or or, or won't even see uh, their their schoolmates um uh, and like you said your boy moving uh, moving up to comp like yeah it's difficult um like i don't know how you've like found the lockdown like it's, it's been i was all right have we recording this sunday i've been fine this week i've been i was quite positive about the start of the week i was like you know i'm just going to enjoy spending time with the kids in fact you know how many years or how many times over the years have i been was i frustrated because i was in work when i wanted to be home when they were babies and i was missing yeah. out on first first words and first steps and all this sort of stuff so i thought well let's just enjoy it for what it is you know you can't go anywhere so let's just actually just try and make the best of it um all week was fine yesterday i said to you i, I felt like <clears throat> felt like shit i felt yeah, really, yeah. like really down really just didn't feel myself i was stressed and then today kids have been loud and in charge or should i say lack of they haven't been listening to what i say but yeah. um you know, it's gonna you're gonna get days like I, I understand that. It's just it's unprecedented, mate. What about you? Definitely. How are you finding it? Yeah, um my son, he um he's adjusting well. He um uh obviously he, he's enjoying his time back on uh, back on the PC and the Xbox, but he's doing his own work that you know that the, the, the school have provided for him. Um we walk the dog every day, you know, that was that's our one a day. Um I work wise for me, um I I was offered a new job probably two weeks before all this broke. Um, I'm going to start work for uh, a Welsh homeless charity in the third sector. I'm really looking forward to it, you know, doing something, um, doing something positive um, because uh, uh, then, you know, this this happened, um, things have paused. Uh, sorry, I'll let me move this. Things have uh, uh, stopped, but there's a lot more. I um uh this it, it'd be it'd be selfish me to uh, to worry about a, you know a job that uh, I'll hopefully get back into in a couple of months. Uh, my wife she um she works uh, on the front line. She works in social care intermediate. Um, the RCT with uh, the NHS they work hand in hand when um, the um, uh, patients who uh, they get over. Um, whatever whatever it um was wrong with them and they they free the beds up a little bit quicker and obviously lately they needed um a lot more oh, yeah. uh you know um you know we could um we could talk about that under funding that um we won't bring we won't bring the pot political side into it we we'll just yeah we we'll just we we'll just you know we've skirted around that but yeah um it is a stressful time for me and my family because claire my wife is out She's out a lot. She hadn't missed. She hadn't missed a minute. You know, I think. Um, I think Andrew Morgan of the RCT leader. He, he said the other day, something like eight hundred of them are, are off sick. And you know, it's you know, it's incredible numbers, isn't it? They say. I know. It's got to be stressful for you, like obviously where your wife's going off, and you know she's been in contact. She's in contact with people through her, through you know, through her work and through her job. And as we're finding yeah. now, is people aren't realizing you know in many cases there's no there's no symptoms and people aren't realizing they're sick until two weeks later when it hits yeah. them and it's too late then because in that two weeks they could have you know they've been around people and 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 let's face it like the nhs is massively you know it's underfunded like when you see some of these nurses and doctors and they're working without prote face protection and and things like that. I've seen a few things on Wales Online where they, like, they're treating people with the virus, but they've got yeah. no face protection. It's that to me that 
that's nothing. No, yeah, it's, it's shocking, mate. Shocking. It's cr- criminal negligence. But um, one of my one of my loved ones have told me not to uh, uh, not to carry on indulging in politics at the moment, but uh, because no, you know, it's it's, e- it's, e- yeah, it's easy to get uh, dragged online, but because uh, I'm quite uh, vociferous, probably in my uh, in my political views. But um, yeah, as long as you know. Um, people are you know it's, it's a scary time for everyone and so you know we'll we'll carry on the political political debate after but um yeah um the numbers you know the numbers are scary i think shout out to um a group of my friends called the relish we we uh we we look at these posts every day and uh, try and educate each other on you know, f- away from the conspiracy theories and um, uh, who's to blame. But um, the numbers escalated now from Italy and Spain. Fucking ridiculous, isn't it? You know, and uh, it, it's, it, um, it, it is coming our way. And I think we, we touched upon it um, probably a week, 10 days ago. I knew people were self-isolating, but they didn't know or not if they had it. Um, I seen a couple of people on my Facebook page then who said they were they they had the COVID nineteen, um, but they 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 were okay with it. You know they were ill, but it wasn't it wasn't life threatening. But as we've seen recently, we weren't going to mention it, as you said, but it's public now. It's yeah, come it's close said, yeah. to us now. It's close to us now because um, um, when Alan. Um, your your partner on the show, Big Alan Jones, when he put it up about uh, uh, Jay James from uh, the Ronda, uh, where big well known Cardiff City fan from the Ronda, you know, always kept himself fit and healthy. Um, like you said, we weren't going to mention it, but it's public knowledge now because his father, his father put it on um, social media. So um, that's the that's the closest now I've seen where somebody. Is um, you know is suffering badly with it, um, but best wishes to Jay obviously from us both and um, and everybody else who um, Jay's um, uh, Jay's wife and family and uh, friends. It's um, it's crazy times, but you know hopefully to pull through and everybody else who um, who's going through it at the moment. Yes, scary times, and it is like Jay is the the kind of closest person in terms of like people you know who I've come you know come in not come into contact with, but like in terms of people you know who've been affected by it, he's the closest, and obviously like me and you both got you know I don't know him now well, I like I know him to say hello to, but um like I got a lot of friends who were close friends with him and. It's scary oh, and he's, like, a, he's, a, he's a top character. He, um, um, like I said, I met him obviously years and years ago following Cardiff. Um, you know, come from a great set of boys from around that who, you know, they they uh, is they bleed Cardiff City over there, and um, Jay's one of them. And um, I've been away with him many times, been you know, been on trips with him. We went to Seville and uh, we in, in Cardiff for a pre season for three season tour out there about I don't know about 10 12 years ago maybe a bit more but um yeah I've been uh, been on many a trip with Jay and um I'm looking forward to the next one with him yeah absolutely think hopefully like his fitness and stuff will will help him pull through it um just circling back a little bit to something like when we were talking about the NHS and the um <clears throat> the kind of underfunding I know like I said not going to really touch on the political side of it but there, there is something which I wanted to run, like mention to you and go into a bit, and that's I hope that when all this is over, when two things happen, and that's number one, the the NHS workers, the people on the front line, and the the key key workers, they get better pay conditions, they get better working conditions, they get the equipment they deserve and they need. And um, they get the funding whether they deserve and they need because hopefully now the world has seen how royally screwed we would be without them. Yeah, we so can like really help with Hundred percent. You know, you can't say any fairer than that. And but there's there's a cross section of society. We're keeping very quiet at the moment because 
you know, they're probably embarrassed. They're probably embarrassed what's gone on um, the last 10 years and they haven't said a thing. But the culture, the culture has got to change. You know, we, I won't get a soapbox, but the, the total culture has got to change from, you know, people, people instead of looking down at society, they've got to start looking up, you know, because the people who they, you know, they've denigrated for all this time are the ones that who are pulling us out of this situation. Yeah. Hold, the, um, the ones who are holding us together, mate. Who, who give, who gives a fuck for the CEOs and the bit and you know the the, the what the one percent does? They nothing, are they? In the grand scheme of things, no. you know. I look at people no. like Richard Branson who, uh, oh, uh, you know, yeah. We won't go into it. But let's uh, let's digress on more interesting yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, there is one thing I want to say, um, and I'm not going to go right right into it in detail. But I want to say to anyone who's watching and listening is when all this is over, don't go to JD Weatherspoons and don't go to Sports Direct. I know it's easy to say that now when we can't go to pubs and go for a cheap pint or we can't, we yeah. don't need to get football boots for our kids. And like I said to you, like I'm guilty of it because I got three kids, three boys. I need to buy cheap football boots so I can buy three pairs. But Oh yeah, I've been in there plenty of times with the, with the football kids, you know, it's, uh, with the cheap socks and things like that. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's, uh, the the, um, the uh, retail culture it's grasped everyone you know we've every everyone is guilty of it yeah the capitalist culture but um, yeah it's something that needs needs certain adjustments yeah they tried to make a few quid when you know putting their their retail staff at risk for when they weren't going to make that money you know it wasn't it wasn't worth the, the they probably made less those days than what they had to pay out in wages but yeah i read um yeah fuck them i read i, I re I read things. I don't. Know, I don't know if it's legit, but some people again pulled over and fined, but um, they've been conned. Have you ever seen anything of like that? I haven't seen that. No, it wouldn't surprise yeah, me. Mate. Yeah. People, it doesn't take people long to uh, to find ways to exploit situations. You'll have this just giving pages, and you'll have charities set up, and pe you know, fines yeah. is just another. It doesn't doesn't cost people much to get a fake blue light, does it? And uh, no, I know. And you get badge, you, you, you know. It, uh, it's still a lot now of uh, these cold calls. But you guys remember it was about I don't know uh, late nineties was it? There was a it was a huge clamp clamp down on cold calls and um, uh, with the TV programs that were um, ripping people off with them. Um, uh, with, yeah, like um, 20, 20 quid an hour, uh, 20, 20 quid a minute, and stuff like that. When they... Yeah, yeah, and like and and deck and things like that. They were getting stitched up on they for um, uh, fake fake wins and things like that but they were charging people excuse me extortionate amounts but it's still going on you know it's still prevalent isn't it yeah oh yeah people will always uh, try and make money whatever the situation even when the world is almost on its knees people yeah, yeah. will still try and take advantage of it anyway um, going back i go I'm sorry son going back go um yeah no i'm looking forward to starting that job eventually obviously it um uh, it's, a, it's a new career for me, but um, last couple of years I've been up in, um, uh, I've been working uh, one self-employed and um, with the TV and film industry um, from you know, BBC Productions to Netflix to Sky. Um, you know, it was it's long hours, but it's, <laughs> it's uh, you, you're the TV and film buff yourself, and everyone uh, has been quite interested. I, you know, I'm not never been a big, big fan of things like Doctor Who and that, but I've a uh, um, couple of months ago I was on the um, Clifton Suspension Bridge up the top. I've never been at the top before with a load of Daleks, so um, and the crew, which was which was interesting, you know. Interesting. But um, this um, that's that, I'm but you know got quite a lot of work through it and um i know it's a sector um in wales is booming with um i'm sure i read this um fifty eight thousand people involved in the moment because a lot of these firms a lot of these um big production companies are coming over to uh, they pick in south wales a lot you know and um, mm. um they 
because they can get a crew um, um, as quick as they can. Um, it's a lot of it's provided from in, in South Wales, which, which is good, and you know, it's a, obviously um, a vibrant and booming economy. And um, if um, uh, I, you know, I may go back to it one day and um, do bits and pieces again. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's a big it's big business, isn't it? And I think um, in Wales, like you say, I think a big advantage for for company of a programs like Doctor Who and other com- uh, films and TV which have showed or sh- uh, have used the, this part of the world is like you say they can they can whip up a crew in you know a couple of days really. Yeah, yeah. From from eight to Z, it's uh, it's all on a play from which is good. Um, um, they they do. They use other um, crews from uh, from Bristol and London. And there, like, um, but I was working in a film studio in Newport, which uh, it hadn't been open long. They've been working on it. They I think it's been open about two years, but they they expanded on it at the moment. Well, before yeah. before this happened, obviously everything's on everything's on lockdown with um, with the film and TV. But uh, it's it's an impressive facility, you know. And um, they uh, what were they filming there when I was there? War of the Worlds. I think it's a BBC production, is it? Um, yeah, I think so. Robert, Robert Carly, maybe. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, um, that's one one uh, you know sector that uh, I may go back into one day. You know, given the opportunity. But um, you were you were film buff time. Yeah, I love. I love, I like watch pretty much any films, TV. Like I watch, give anything a go. I just enjoy it. Um, I think, um, funny enough, like War of the Worlds, and it, the world is like that at the moment, and it? it's like um, you go outside yeah. and it's so quiet. It's like uh, it's like the start of a zombie film or a you know like an apocalyptic blockbuster. Oh, yeah, where it's just... <laughs> in the middle of a in the middle of a James Cameron Hollywood blockbuster. <laughs> it's like people are putting links up. People have been putting links up online saying you know putting their favorite dystopian film because there's been quite a few, but. Um, <laughs> Tongue in cheek, obviously, but uh, sadly, it's this as close as we've ever been to one, I think. Isn't it? Yeah, did you see um, that Netflix are released or they release? Uh, do they have their like uh, they suggest 10 films, don't they, a day or whatever? And then yeah. um, they literally, when the lockdown happened in the UK, they one of the one of the um, or a couple of the suggestions were like uh, contagion and and pandemic and all these different yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, you know talk well, about ironically, uh, taking advantage what, i know ironically on my planet just before it happened i had outbreak i love that film that was on my planet from a uh, couple of months ago um uh, what was the other one heat and there was another one which was connected to uh what was going on but uh yeah outbreak um with uh dustin hoffman uh, yeah, that was a good film and obviously it's a good one yeah yeah there's um there's a film called contagion which is due to come out in september and is literally about it's got loads of big actors in uh gwyneth paltrow's in it and a few others i think ewan mcgregor might be in it um yeah I literally contagion, it's basically yeah. it's li- literally what's happening now pretty much yeah, to a yeah. t which is frightening because when you know you have things like the simpsons then you where they predicted the future and and all these different it's so often hollywood and tv <clears throat> mirrors what happens in real life yeah yeah oh the simpsons conspiracies they've been going on for a while haven't they but i think they 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 guess so much so much over the years some of it was going to stick yeah it's, it is weird isn't it like how some of it's so so bang on but i mean yeah, you like well, you to say. Simpsons, you, you, you were a Simpsons fan, Sam? I used to love it. Well, um, like I thought, it, like the the nineties and early two thousands, I thought it was really good. Yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like as the years have gone on, I feel like it's become it, it's it's gone away from what it was, what made it what it was. Yeah, like it's a, it's a strange one because uh, it's, I chat about it quite a bit online. There's a there's a few of us who, uh, uh, yeah, that the probably Simpsons. Seasons one to twelve, one to thirteen, yeah. they were you know unbeatable. Top one, you know, it was uh, yeah, um, they were the undisputed best. But um, since then, like you said, the um, um, uh, it's it's moved on slightly. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I I tuned out. I tuned out probably after after twelve seasons. But 
it's uh, it's it's going to be a funny one when somebody told me the other day i think they've decided to quit now aren't they and that's going to be a bit sure. strange yeah that's going to be a bit strange how are they going to how are they going to finish it if you see yeah. what i mean because you know obviously yeah, i reckon they'll probably probably do another film i do i think they'll probably so finish it with a film based in the present what do you think the film was in left down for you it was all right like it was better than a lot of films out there but yeah, i didn't yeah. think it was anything amazing like the problem is is back in the day with the simpsons is the reason it was funny is because it, the kids could watch it but there was jokes in there for adults as well which weren't too on the nose and that and as time's gone on and you've gone into a more politically correct correct era of television and entertainment i think they stopped putting in as many jokes for the adults and i think yeah. that was part of the attraction was why people enjoyed it but i don't you know, I, i've never i've never got bogged down really with all uh, all this new millennial um uh pc uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't affect me one way or the other but no i seen there was a, there was a big um there was a big um controversy about uh, 20 years later there's a big controversy about a pool on there about yeah how we, um, and um little britain as well i've heard they're yeah. trying to bring that back and netflix want to bring it back and um apparently straight away a load of people were like oh you can't do that and it's really offensive and look to me i, I just think like if you're if you're offended by something then fine if you're offended if you were the person who's watching it or you're offended right you know that's that's yeah. your that's your prerogative, isn't it? What I can't get my head around is people getting offended for other people. That kind of mm. going down that route starts to get a bit ridiculous for me. But it is what it is, isn't it? Okay. Okay. It is what we, it is. That's it. We move on, yeah? Um, all right, then. So we've... Uh, just before we get into, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of, uh, of you and the bits and pieces you've been doing, uh, for the people who are not familiar with you, probably should have done this before we talked for 20 minutes well, there we go um, <laughs> tell us like just a bit about you where you grew up that sort of stuff where'd you get how'd you get yeah. to where you are today um i'm anthony tony rivers from uh, a little town called mountain ash um big football fan from before i can remember um cardiff city um from Went to my first Cardiff City game with my mother, about, I was about 10. And then when I was 13, I, I went with the boys, first of all. Um, uh, it was a Friday night game. Cardiff played York. Um, I lied through my teeth. I remember lying to my mother saying we were we had a lift from one of the parents, but uh, mm -hmm. we, we went on the bus and I met the phone and them from Pondy bus station about <laughs> half past 10 at night. Saying, oh, we broke down, and it was, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was only 13, and, uh, but we can't kind of play York. Um, one nil down at half time, I think it was about two and a half thousand, and uh, two cracking goals, second half, one in. Um, yeah, I was, I was hooked then, and um, um, I've, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time watching other football over the years as well, be, um, uh, because probably for a decade or two, that's what I did, and like, like more like a lot of the people we know 80s 90s it was like we you could do you could do three games a week sometimes you know it was the cheap cheap train train tickets and different things like that and obviously boys were driving in transits and mds and we tried 10 15 we were back you know chuck a fiver in and you're going to carlisle you know um, yeah that was yeah. that was it then and now it was 150 quid for a train journey so uh oh, time yeah. to check <laughs> times have changed but yeah i um Big Cardiff fan, got involved um, with um, yeah with with the, uh, the casual culture scene, shall we say, and then moved on. Then moved on to the football violence, and I um, <laughs> got got uh, yeah got got a few um, unfortunately got a few arrests and jail terms under my belt for that. But you know you move on, you grow up, and. I've done a lot of writing then over the years. Um, I've had stuff published and um, not, um, you know, to, uh, the biggest thing probably I publish is uh, obviously uh, the Soul Crew book about Cardiff City. And, well, not just about Cardiff City, it was uh, 
the whole um, um, the whole lifestyle behind it, really. The clothes, music, um, everything. It was uh, yeah, the mm. cultures we were. Do you know where, cultures we were caught up in. Do you know how many copies that book sold now to date? Yeah, we. Um, it was it was around hundred thousand. Yeah, it was around hundred thousand. But um, we we had it translated into um, Spanish and Italian. I did a book launch in. I had a book signing in Copenhagen. Um, wow, that's yeah, mad. Yeah, you know, it isn't was. It? Um, we um, it, we had, we had, we had a lot of attention for a few years. You know, some negative, some positive. Um, but the positive stuff was great because, um, yeah, like you said got invited to do a book launch in Copenhagen. We went to, um, it was the guy, Jonas, he, he had his own clothes shop out there. And at the time, obviously, the, the internet and everything, it was, uh, um, he, he was using quite a few of the sites that I was. And he invited us out there. Uh, Dave couldn't make it. Um, I think he was uh, DJing. But me and Garth Hopkins went out there and um, it was it was packed. You know, they there was lads that came there from Malmo in Sweden. You know, but I know there's only about 40 miles away from Copenhagen, but still, yeah. we had, um, I think I took took two boxes out there, 50, 50 bucks, and um, they all they all sold the, all these all these Danes who were queuing up, like who wanted to hear about uh, <laughs> Cardiff City and uh, the, uh, the adventures of Cardiff City over the years. Must have been quite quite strange experience to like. You know, to obviously you wrote the book and you got it published, and then to go to a you know a Scandinavia and have people queue up. To, yeah, I think know, they, want, they wanted and us to come been... to Italy as well. Sorry, but they yeah, it was great and really, really accommodating, uh, intelligent, lovely people, the Danes. And um, yeah, we had a great weekend out there. And the I know they wanted us to go to Italy to do one. But um, nothing came of that after. But uh, I know it's still for sale in in a couple of shops in um, Rome. Uh, there was one in Milan, casual shop in Milan, and um, yeah, it was nice. Like I said, it was um, it, we we had a lot of positivity and and a lot of um, a lot of attention. But then we had a bit of a negative press as well because. Well, I say negative because there was no such thing as <laughs> negative publicity, but. Uh, um Rodri Morgan's wife Julie she um she stood up and when when we um we had the film option um I'll explain more about that now but um they wanted a London firm um one of Irving Welsh's companies wanted to um option the book to make it into a film um it was going on for, for years but Julie Morgan stood up in um in the Houses of Parliament and um she was, she was talking about talking about us in Westminster, how this terrible, terrible um, uh, culture and um, and uh, you know uh, all these hooligans. How, how dare they try and turn it into a film? And like you know, we were glamorising it like that. But to me and Dave, that was uh, that was a lovely moment. That was getting mentioned in, in the houses of parliament. Yeah. Like the thing is, like you know, if you said that about. You think of all the films that have been based on true story or loosely based on real life people. If you said, "Well, you can't, uh, you can't have anything which remotely glamorizes violence or anything, you know, negative," there would never be a film made, would there? Because everything, yeah, that oh, we, we that, were talking, you know, is we rem- were... yeah, oh no, no, definitely, I know. We were talking earlier about Johnny Owen. Um, he's been a guest on your show. Uh, oh, Dear old friend of mine, John, and he's the one who gave the book to. I didn't know this was going on at the time, but he gave the book to Irvin Welsh, and Irvin really enjoyed it. Um, and then, yeah, we had a few meetings, um, and then um, we it was set up then for for the film. We had a few meetings for a few years, you know, some some uh, I think some lottery money came through and different bits and pieces, but um, it faded eventually. But didn't really matter as well on, on one hand to me and Dave because the amount of publicity Irving Welsh was giving us at the time, we probably sold half our copies through through that, like, you know. 
Yeah. I mean, people are still asking about it, don't they? I they saw like um, a couple of comments like in the post that I put up when I said you were coming on, people were asking about the film still. So like I think people would still still be interested in it. And I think people would be interested in it because it would be different to, you know, how many football hooligan films have we seen over the years. Um, well, it would be something different to... when they'd see one based on a Welsh club and yeah, I think it was there was a lot of interest because um I know, you know, don't wanna tap myself on the back, but to the to the purist reading there, there was more um yeah, we've had a lot we've had so many nice comments about if you weren't just about the football violence, you know. It was um yeah, everything yeah. surrounding it, you know. We were um uh, me, myself and Dave, Dave uh, Dave's era was late seventies, eighties and he was uh you know, we were on the cusp of all these wonderful cultures that were coming in. You know, um, I'm like talking about the teacher there when, like, when I was, um, you know, when I was 17, 17, 18, just going out properly on the town. You know, we had the um, um, acid house was just starting, really. You know, the indie scene, and um, you know, for me, the 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 football clothes scene was just kicking in, and he was just. It was, it was it was remarkable what was going on for um from it from a teenage point of view you know oh yeah my um <clears throat> my missus and my kids mock me regularly because i bang on about the 90s as a just as an era for for like music and clothes like people look back at it so fondly because the that 90s era of brit pop and indie music was just incredible but then yeah obviously like you say you add in like the the house music and and the other bits and it was just a ma just a, a magical musical musical era and culture which it was a great time hasn't been I, matched I, it was a great time like the 80s obviously was um uh the genesis of it all but um i there's no many djs that i've seen uh, who, who have said like the 80s music scene was uh, better than the 90s clubbing scene you know the house no. scene in the 90s that's when you know it really um it really evolved and um i've um i, I was big into it myself you know um uh from quite early you know i was going you know we were, we were going to raves when we were 17 um and through you know probably through till um um quite later on but um yeah it was um it was, it was a great time to be involved yeah so i'm gonna circle back a little bit uh, and just ask you about how the book came about um and then we'll kind of move along but um it was um just before sorry sorry Sam, go on no go on go on you're right go on let's go with that no the book the um um I was regular regular traveler with with Cardiff me and my me and my mates and um we'd you know <laughs> we'd have our own stories in nearly every week you know following uh, following football and, um as it came on to the late nineties we were i think we were we were going to wreck some or something on the bus and a couple of the boys were you know we were <laughs> i was holding court at the back of the bus telling them this and that and you know what they, and a couple of the boys were saying well, you want you want to really think about writing a book and i thought uh, i didn't really thought about it before but uh yeah it, that's when it developed then and i think about 98 99 um i was coming at the end of um um uh, 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 i was a big club in head probably through that and i i wanted to slow it down a bit for for several reasons and um I thought I, I need to do a bit of writing here and I I got it together and I found out there was um he was a really small publisher in um somewhere in Scotland and he did a book called Tuesday Night in Grimsby and it was like you know five ninety nine or something and I, I read it and I sent him some of my material and he wanted to do it. So next thing, I got a letter then a couple of months later saying that uh, he was going, uh, he was going bust. So, you know, I apologised for that, and uh, I 
and he said, "Oh, send my, you know, send my stuff back." And it took a while to get everything back, but he he sent it back. And then probably around two thousand two thousand one, um, a mate of mine from London said that there was a publishers in Blackpool called Milo, and they did did quite a few quite a few of the books, the popular ones. There was one, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Man City, uh, the governors came out a couple of years before I was in, but it was it was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. And the Sheffield United book um, came out about two thousand, called the Blades Business Crew, about that obviously about their firm. Uh, a guy called Steve Cowan's, but Paul Eaton wrote the forward for it, and it was one of the best I read. I and the thought was great, and I thought, you know, they did a good story, a good honest story, and um, it wasn't obviously it wasn't just about uh, the football, you know, it was about um, you know, the the gigs they went to and the, and the clothes they, they wore during during these times. And I thought I I can do that. Um, sorry, sorry, and uh, yeah, a uh, guy from London said he set up the meeting with with the publisher Milo Peter. I mean, Dave went up to Manchester one day and uh, he sat this down. He said, uh, he, te- he said, I'll tell you straight, the only two books I want to do, he said, now, how do anyone? He said, uh, Leeds. He said, Leeds. He said, because they hadn't done a book and obviously they um, they had their history to tell. And he said, Cardiff City. And uh, that was it then. I um, mean, Dave, we'd done a bit of research on different things yeah, and we way. went to. Um, uh, we went on our separate ways. We we had we paid somebody then to uh, type it all out for us, and and yeah, we sent sent piece by piece up to uh, up to Milo and Blackpool, and that was it then. Um, yeah, I think uh, was it two thousand and two, two thousand and two. There was a there was a printers in Eberville. Um Sorry, man. There's a printers in Eberville and uh, that's where I had my first copies from the uh, boxes brought to me one of my mates brought uh, brought me this box and it was uh, it was quite thrilling you know to, to see yeah it must to have been quite it, surreal uh, as well like. it was for a few years yeah because uh, he's, around that time then I I talk about the negativity with um, you know the bad press from certain MPs but then I I chaired two I said I chaired two um, lectures in UIC for oh, okay. s- social studies students, and I had you know we had a great reception, you know, and a round of applause at the end, and that was that was nice. And then I I think I've helped about four or five with their um, with their degrees from uh, sociology, which they've you know I've interviewed them, and no, oh, they've interviewed me, sorry, and you know they've. Um, I helped them on their way, which is nice. This is another, uh, you know, um, positive yeah. thing. Yeah, give, giving something back and just uh, kind yeah, of you know, it's, it's, contribute, I, I remember, isn't it? Yeah, I remember um, one of the one of my mates. Um, his father was a police officer, and he came on to me after, and he said, "Well, I read that." He said, "At me, and I didn't." I, he thought it would be, you know, just pure, pure football violence, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. But he, he said I was pleasantly surprised what um, what you boys, <laughs> what you boys do as well, you know, in your, <laughs> in your spare time. It's not just like going around. It's not just going around trying to punch people, you know. <laughs> I know. It, it's it, you know a lot of people will say, oh, you know, the code, the the the, the certain code that hooligans had, you know, it was like. Obviously, no women and children involved, and um, uh, he was never in public places. That was bullshit to an extent. You know, there was uh, there was a lot of uh, you know there was a lot of violence organised away from uh, the prying eyes, which um, which really were the best. Really, to keep it out of the public uh, domain. But um, yeah, I knocked it right on the head. Um, uh, you know, to be f- around the time when my son was born, two thousand and six, I uh, decided like I'm not even, you know, I'm you know, not even going near the the pubs anymore because the police, you know, uh, by that stage at Cardiff for for, for a few years, it was um, 
uh, you, you you get Nick walking down the wrong street. You know what I mean? Yeah. With, yeah. If you with if you with certain people, um, and yeah, you know. because of the book as well, you were you know everyone the police everyone knew who you were as well. So it's yeah. it's not like you could yeah, keep no, a, yeah, we, a low profile. We we had a little cat and mouse game going on for a long time with the police, you know, and um, it was uh, <laughs> it was fun then. But looking back, like I, was, uh, I you know, you brought you bring some, uh, you know, I brought some uh, terrible things home to my uh, to my family, you know. But something that my like my son now he's thirteen, right? He 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 knows a little bit because some of his friends have told him stuff about me. But I've you know I wouldn't I would never dream of boring him with. Uh, with what I no. got up to then, you know, because uh, he's uh, he's a lot more level-led than I was. Yeah, it's a, it's, um, it's it's a weird one because, like these days, like in some ways, you were luck, like lucky. The era that you were in was like in these days, you get people get in jail time and like long sentences and and banning orders for 10 years and stuff for very very little yeah whereas we, we were, you know in the we in, were lucky in the 90s you were well. lucky oh we were lucky in other ways as well because i could um i could tell you you know a lot of times where we were lucky to get out of these situations in one piece you know yeah so yeah i got i, I had injuries over the years from different fights and whatever and uh but uh, you know it was uh looking back it was like you know we did uh we did some tough things but you know, that was it that was part of growing up and uh um i'm glad you know we i can look back and if only i look back on like i said earlier about um the culture fondly where um you know it's still still prevalent today with um with everything with the clothes and the, the trainers and the music and it's all it's all, it's all come with us you know yeah and i think sometimes that that's uh people on like the outside of football generally they they get lost in this thing that football fans are, are thugs and and this that and the other but but a lot of it you know like you say like you still love football and you even though you're not involved in the, in the violent side of it now you still love football you still love the clothes the music and the you know the trainers and the, it's just is yeah, what it is yeah, it's the culture yeah. and you got friends for life which you met at the football oh yeah I, I've, I've i've been a tennis obsessive for years you know but um um i was i was into the clothes before really before i got involved with with the violence you know it's it's, it's it's a, as I, I think I wrote in the book. It's small steps, you know. You some some people just think they can walk into a, walk into a firm and uh, you know throw put a stone island jumper on, throw a couple of punches, and that's it. But no, it took you know you take uh, <laughs> it's a long it's, it's a long journey. Hmm. So um, you've also had a a pub in Mountain Ash. Um, what year did you get that? Um, we opened the pub. I think it was two thousand and ten. Um, did you did you take that pub over, or did you open it fresh? Like, no, my wife, um, my wife took it over first of all. I was still working, um, and she needed um, she needed a hand. So eventually, I think a few months later, I gave my job up, and uh, my mind then was uh, thinking, oh, it'd be nice to turn this into. Uh, you know something for a bit of a cult venue for Mountain Ash, but uh, yeah, he went, uh, yeah, he went a bit further than that. And we were, we were, we were blessed, you know, with uh, with with a good following, and we met a lot of lovely people and made lifelong friends, you know, through it. Um, I I was doing promotion after it, bits and pieces. I I stopped for a while now because other uh, things have gone away, but um, yeah, the through the pub years like we had uh, you know we had so many so many popular acts and it was we had bands from come down from london from birmingham from sheffield who were uh, unsigned but you know we um we loved all that because they had their own unique followings um there's a band like from the west midlands called the lines and that they were fantastic and we packed it out 
um, it was um, it was a fine line between again bands with cover versions and a fine line between obviously um, with original with all the original material is um, um, it, it, you've got to um, there's a there's a balance and act in um, when when you're running a, a, a pub to uh, you 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 essentially obviously you've got to um, uh, bums on seats and uh, money in the till you know so it was um, sorry sorry um, yeah it's it it it, it was um, uh, a fine balance in act of that was. Yeah, you got to try and keep everyone happy, I suppose, as well, haven't you? Like, you've got to... People want to listen yeah, to have, mu- music they know, but also... Like some some weekends we'd have um, original acts, and then some weekends we'd have tributes and cover bands, um, which, you know, you've got to try and... Like, I've been tongue-tied then earlier, but, yeah, you've got to try and mix it up a bit. Um, uh, but, you know, I think the first first like popular dj night we had was uh, i booked bears and um hold on nobody um um uh, few people didn't believe that we had him booked in this little tap little pub in mountain ash and we uh and then it, somebody calls me and said have you seen the news about bears and i'm like what and he said oh he's been fucking sent to prison so no, like, oh, no. god yeah so he was down for a few months uh, no, it was probably about six weeks, seven weeks, so we had to uh, delay it. And then when he finally did come, it was a uh, it was a breath of fresh air, and that that was the start of it. And then um, um, it was uh, that's uh, mad, though, isn't uh, it? To have like a a, lo- a local local pub and have like bears DJ and you know that's um, and the thing yeah, is when the start, other, really. when other bands and people see oh they've had bears there. It suddenly becomes, I'd imagine, easier for you to get a different, or at least speak to a, a someone else about coming, oh, because yeah, you can, you can, you've got that in your back pocket to say, well, Bez did it, because I know even from doing the podcast, com- now compared to when I first started, it's a lot easier for me to at least have conversations with guests and some big names because yeah, i've got yeah. a few names which i can refer to and say well you know they've come on the show so and so has been on the show it just, yeah, just so not it's... not that you're using them to get to other people but it's just they think yeah, it does snowball um i think john then yeah, johnny owen he um he, he was doing bits and pieces with alan mcgee obviously um the legendary creation uh owner um who you know who give oasis their, their big break and alan mcgee then was after a couple of months then of uh, after we we had bears alan mcgee was he he was a resident dj for us you know and um he he loved it there um because he'd been living in he'd been living in mid wales quite a quite a few years and um yeah alan he became a good friend of the um good close friend of us and the, you know my my wife and uh yeah, I, I owe a lot to Alan McGee what what, what he done for us in the pub. Um, but you know, I got a good friend, Dave Driscoll, who's a massive promoter. He's doing so well the last few years. Um, he's a well a pen kiber boy, Mount Nash boy, and he he sorted me out right out as well. You know, he gave me give us lots of advice, and I get the first. Um, really big one we had was goalie looking chain um dave was dave knew him for, from years ago and he, he'd done a lot of work with him so he said like i gave you a few of the goalie looking chain boys and um like we pick this date now um in when was it easter easter monday right no was that east, no, it was easter sunday sorry right it would have been fucking busy anyway right because <laughs> it's easter sunday but we decided for dave sort of goalie looking chain right and for free right and we had uh we had uh, the um the council capacity they get in the license was 180 people right and by the end of that day i think we had about 550 600 people in, in this little pub in mountain ash like and i remember me and my, <laughs> me and my wife in the middle of it we were fucking sat we were there sweating like oh god <laughs> dave was saying dave just goes say do what he said he said there's two um 
um, there's two chaoses, he said. One's good chaos and one's bad chaos. He mm-hmm. said the good chaos, he said, because they're all fucking scrapping. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that, was the start of, uh, that was the start of a brilliant time for us. And uh, yeah, I still got I still got some of the videos, and um, there's there's sweat coming off the walls, and it was it was amazing. We we had we had we had a really good staff. We had a really good um, uh, security there that day. But even though the, our back fence, we had this back fence built, and um, there was so many people trying to get in, they fucking fell over. So oh, Jesus. yeah, I know. So it was um, it was one thing after another that day. But we look back, it was great. And then after that, then we had um, Dirty Sanchez and um, uh, Sven Gali, the film with John. Um, um, John and Vicky, you've probably seen, they put a, put a lovely um, post up about the NHS. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's been spread everywhere and it's gone viral. But um, yeah, John and Vicky, they, um, uh, he, he, he got it, he, he was lucky to get it for this role in in Svengali and they were at the pub for a week and um that's when he worked this charm on and because my wife that was when they first got together really my wife claire was saying she's not gonna fall for that mirtha charm mm-hmm. and uh, uh i said she fucking will <laughs> and she did <laughs> and she did and uh, and they know you know they get married now which is fantastic yeah. and all that started in um in our little pub in mount nash which was um it was it was a crazy time because my me and my family we went to went to America for two weeks, and the day before Sir Gali was filming, it was Cardiff Liverpool at Wembley, right? Mm. I nearly missed the nearly missed that game, but managed to get it. Managed to get in an indirect flight from Manchester. We flew to Manchester, got an indirect flight to Manchester. I can somehow got through the day in um, um, the cup final, the unlucky one we you were know, with the with oh, the penalties. God, yeah. But then seven o'clock on the Monday morning, we had a bang on the door out the back. I knew they were coming, but I didn't realize what time. It was the catering crew of Svengali, and um, I think Universal Studios was um, were their backers, weren't they? Mm. So um, they were there all week, and uh, it was uh, it was it was a great time. And it was um, we get them got to meet um, Brian Ebard, you know, the um, legendary Welsh actor. Um, and singer, and and he, um, uh, it was it was it was a touching moment, a touching for the film, really, because he was playing John's dad, and he was um, he was uh, terminal, terminal cancer, and um, mm. ironically, it, it, in real life, that's what was happening as well, which we didn't know. Yeah, I think John knew, but yeah, the, you know, we. Um, we didn't know for a while, but that was uh, that was very, very poignant, you know. Yeah, God, that's uh, must have been quite funny emotional. Man, really, like, yeah. really funny man. Like, and it was like he was, uh, he was <laughs> the DJ on the day was um, Liam and Noel Gallagher's brother Paul. Yeah, yeah. And and I was talking to Paul and and Brian Ebard and took a photo with him, and I was like, this is again, this is a bit surreal, like you said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's, it is weird it's just strange like because you know you were very lucky like to to have you know not luck though because it's, it's through your kind of hard work as well to put on the events but obviously you've got you know you've had you had um john power from uh from cast yeah and, we were uh, flat out we were flat out really every week we'd, we'd try something new and tr- you know sometimes perhaps we went a bit over the top but um uh, yeah, John Powell was a was a lot big gig, and um, uh, it was we sold you know sold out straight away, and uh, we knew we were leaving, but it was it was nice to go out um, on a high with that. It was um, that was our last big gig, and a few months before that, um, you'd get you'd get, you'd get constant emails from um, uh, from promoters and uh, different music agencies, and um, I had an email from a guy from Red, I think, and. Um, he said, "Do you want to?" He said, "Tom Nicholas from the states." He said, "And his band um, are coming over for a small tour." Couldn't really think who Tom Nicholas was, and then he told me he was um, a guy out of American Pie, and he does his own. He does his own acoustic and uh, got a backing band. So I looked up and I thought, "That's something different." Then you know, that that bring. Um, That's mad, though, isn't it? I thought that'd bring, you know, a, 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 an eclectic. Uh, 
crowd to the to the pub, not just because of the music, obviously, because of uh, because you know this Hollywood. Uh, yeah, yeah, American Pie was uh, was a massive, massive um, yeah, obviously um, massive film. And when he turned up, he turned up. Um, everybody, it, it was everyone's packed the pub in and out, and uh, every every gig you you again stress levels are fucking up there. Like, and um, I'm in contact with them. And then they turn up in this big, uh, big Mercedes truck, right? Um, him and his, him and his American entourage, you know, and, they <laughs> and I'm trying to give them directions. I was a one way behind the pub. I'm trying to give them directions, but they've never seen anything like like in their lives, you know, <laughs> in the town Mount <laughs> They, they're more used to, uh, you know, the more opulent areas of uh, yeah. California. <laughs> but they. They were great, and they they couldn't um, they couldn't thank us enough. And he came back in a few months later, which was nice. And um, one of the nicest guys I met during my time at the pub, Tom Nicholas, was he was really uh, um, he was really warm and receptive. And he, he we met a couple of people over the years who were you know miserable twats really, but um, yeah. but he was he was he was he was so genuine as well. Like, and uh, that was that was nice. You keep in keep in contact with him now, like all these years. Only um, tweet to each other now and again, you know, and uh, keep in touch. Keep in touch, really, via Twitter. But he's obviously yeah. still very busy. He's still very busy with the stuff he does. Alan, I'm you know, I've been big friends with Alan McGee, and uh, yeah, keep in touch there. And like the, the boys from Goldie Looking Shane, I um, I went to see him. A um, couple of us went down to Puff Call on their tour. Um, which was um, which was great. We went down to Puff Call and we met the um, we met the famous uh, Biggie from uh, oh, Tom yeah. Handy. Yeah, yeah. I had to get a photo of Biggie because uh, he was he went he been going fucking viral for uh, ages, haven't he? Yeah. So uh, that was um, yeah. He, 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 nice guy. He, he gets he gets a lot of shit right online, but to me, when I um, yeah, when I saw what uh, the the BBC PC did down about his brother, and how yeah. he, you know, he just does this for his brother, and um, uh, who passed away chase, sadly, chasing a dream, isn't he? And you know, he's like he's, he's just trying to do something and do it for and the right funny. reasons. And he's funny, and he don't care. Like he's, um, you know, it's a uh, it, it's it's a nice little story. Yeah, spot on, mate. Spot on. There you go. Did you have like? much trouble like in the pub where people would come because of the stuff you know what you were perhaps known for previously do you have many well, people come in and try it on well the the biggest we were there for five years now i mean we you know, we open nearly every day and we had really only one big massive fight we had and it was it was boys from local from a local rugby team uh, who came mm. up and um they um they were rivals to Mountain Ash. I won't. I won't. I won't, uh, I won't say any names because this went to court. But uh, that was fucking carnage, and you know, it was um, that was the worst we've seen. You get the odd scrap and all that, but nothing we couldn't handle. But um, yeah, that time, this time, the old pub went up. Um, you know, tables and the beer garden was fucking wrecked. Um, football wise, um, it was. It was more. It was more like mates who were who were bringing different people to uh, the pub. I, you know, I, a lot of good support, obviously from from my Cardiff mates over the years. You know, um, it, it, it was great. They always they always turned up to a gig or a DJ night. But like one time, I remember um, a lad I knew from Portsmouth called Eddie Crispin. Eddie Crispin, yeah, look, nice kid. Um, one of Pompey's old old heads. If you see the photos of the six five seven online, he's in all of them nearly. But he's a, he's a nice guy, and he he phoned me. They had swans away. He was just after Christmas, and it was snowing, and he didn't know if it was going to get um, postponed. And they took two coaches and a few mini buses to Swansea. You know, they're they're firm, right? Um, and they um, uh, they said they wanted to come to the pub. After the game, I said, fair enough, you know, I got a couple of extra staff on. And they turned up, but just before they turned up, like two police fans came um, outside the doors, come in. Um, they knew they knew me, like, uh, Tony, what's the crack? And we've just had, uh, 
we've just had Swansea police on the uh, um, on the radio telling us Pompey are coming for Cardiff here. And he said, uh, no, it's fuck all to do with football. He said they come in just for a drink. And they they did, they drunk us. <laughs> they turned up about 100, 120 of them. Drunk us uh, dry, they did. It was, it was just mm-hmm. great. But 99% of them were, were brilliant. They they really treated it with... Um, with respect and um yeah it was it was great the the bell ringer was there he was sat at the bar drinking shots mm. you know the bell ringer john yeah yeah and uh yeah that was uh that was another bizarre night for us in mountain ash i mean all them from portsmouth but um just before they left we had a couple of welsh flags up and uh one of them tried to drag uh pull the welsh flag off most of them had left by then so i said um I fucking told him straight. I said, I don't give a fuck how many of you. Uh, put that flag back, you fucking English cunt. You know, mm-hmm. Maybe I shouldn't have done it, but I said, look, this is where I live now. You're trying to take a fucking piss. And yeah. He was like, oh, no, you know, and he was fa- he was sound after that. So um, he probably realised that. And I said, well, look, you know, Eddie and the boys are on the bus there. They'd give him a slap first before I would, you know, for yeah, doing that. Yeah, but, yeah just yeah, taking a piss a bit, like, uh, it was just one one dickhead, well, you know. The thing is, uh, though, we've all done it, haven't we? After a few beers, made a bad decision, done something stupid, like. Yeah, yeah, but um, I probably probably shouldn't have put the Welsh flags up, but I wanted to wind them up a little bit, you know. This is the way, Yeah. Well, we're done. Um, all right. So, so you left the pub, you left the pub, and. Uh, how long were you there for, did you say? Four years? Five. Five years. And then um, we um, we took over Mountain Ash Rugby Club. My wife was uh, the stewardess there. Um, but after about two years, and then she got offered a, a new job in care, which was, uh, was a lot better. A um, lot better. I was a lot better pay, which um, we took. Uh, we went on then. And um, since then, I've been... Um, uh, I had a couple of years working um, in the shop in Merthyr with Dickie Febley, brilliant Dickie. I had a shop called A1 in Merthyr. He, he asked me, did I uh, want to rent one of the rooms off him? And I did. Sorry. It was great for a couple of years. But um, the retail industry in towns like Merthyr, they when, um, when you've got a retail park about half a mile away, you went with free car parking. Yeah. It's it difficult, was, um, Yeah. But I, I enjoyed it and I still do bits and pieces online, you know, sell sell uh, uh vintage and try and I'm always I'm always searching for so always searching for the good gear online. Excuse me. It's um it's not e- eBay when um when the vintage thing came um yeah, when it started getting popular amongst some of the football boys. Uh, it was probably about ninety nine and that uh, you'd see the same people. You'd go on eBay Italian and you'd eBay Deutsch, eBay German, right? When you could pick up Stone Island and CP and Best Company and for buttons um, before they before they really sussed how yeah. much it was worth, like, and um, it'd be the same. <laughs> it'd be the same amount of people you'd see uh, vying for that on the last second, right? Yeah, for yes. This CP Company mainly make it for about forty quid. And you, there'd it, be ten people, and and still, still made. So them today, you know, uh, from from Motherwell to Stoke, uh, to London to Bridgend, you know, it was it was a cross section of people who, uh, who all shared that same, uh, <laughs> all shared the same goal, same interests. Yeah, I, um, yeah, yeah. Funny enough, I went to Germany. When was I? I don't know, like years ago. And then yeah. I was just like walking around the shops in Hamburg and whatever. And I went in the shop and there was just like a load of Patrick Cox shoes. And they were like the equivalent of like 20, 30 quid. I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, check in and asking the German girl who I was with, asking her to check if it was correct. Like, and then she was like, yeah, no, it's fine. So yeah, I Patrick, bought like a few Patrick pairs. Like, Brilliant. Because I were, just couldn't um... believe it. Couldn't believe the difference in price from here to there. Like, I don't know if it's I doubt it's it, still the same now, like but it was better before the Euro as well, before before they uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it really when it was the Deutsche Markers, it was a lot cheaper then. But um yeah, Patrick Cox for for one there was I was 
they were huge on the on the football club in scene um um early nineties yeah and um um I had a few pairs I I um do they still go? I don't know if they still I'm not sure. Them. I no, got no, one no. I got one pair left which is from my haul all them years ago. Yeah, yeah. I bought a few pairs like when I was out there and I just got one pair left which uh still in they're, not, yeah, they're yeah. pretty good neck luck, but um I don't know if they still do them now. Germany, I, love, I always always love the trip to Germany and um it's one of my yeah, favorite was, places um, I've ever been. It was a famous trainer store in Frankfurt called Sneaker King. And mm. uh I went out there just after they moved and they moved to a big uh big place and um they uh he was telling me uh, the guy Pomo, one of one of Frankfurt's main lot, like he was telling me that uh, they couldn't source this because the internet had um had kicked in. It was hard, it's hard, it's hard, and hard, and hard to source the original Adidas material, you know, all yeah. the uh, um, all the all the real, the proper goods from uh, from way back then. But uh, yeah, and it's, it's it's hard as well online now. I think you've got so many. I don't like to use a term, but collectors who um, uh, who, who got involved in the game, but um, they. Uh, um, they 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 uh they poured a lot of stuff to themselves which uh um you know you see. yeah but yeah it's um i'm i'm still i'm still searching <laughs> still, still looking searching. yeah so i i'm all i'm all i'm hoping when in 20 years time you know when i'm in my, in my 60s and i'm still uh still searching for that uh that elusive pair and that elusive coat you know what i mean yeah like like we talked the other day like I um I'm a sucker for a coat. I can't. Mm. I it seems to be my one coats and Adidas trainers are my like two weaknesses. Like even, since I've had kids, I've chilled out a bit. Like in terms of like how much I spend on clothes and that. But um, yeah. but like I'm a sucker for a coat. If I see a coat which I really like, I gotta have it like there and then, and uh, I just can't get talked my, out uh, of it. That's my one weakness as well. So trainers that's why yeah of course <laughs> but um what's um, yeah, what's your um, favorite piece of clothing mate which you own now depends i don't uh, know what i own now um i don't know um it, it's, it, it's hard to say i bought um i bought a nice um camouflage arc air um hooded little parka a couple of two months ago maybe and uh yeah, I just like to uh, keep uh, um, keep updating my wardrobe, as it were. You know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm terrible. I am for uh, <laughs> for jackets and uh, different things. But there's there's all there's all different types of looks going on. You know, there's um, um, there's a more modern look now, really. But um, see, I'm which, stuck in a nine. Still stuck uh, in the nineties. I admit, I'm still stuck in. Parkers and polo shirts and hood like mm -hmm. Stone Island hoodies and nothing, wrong with that. nothing wrong trainers with that. and baggy jeans. That's me. But um, good, mate. I never, I, I, I like a couple of times. Like my missus will be like, "Oh, do you want these jeans?" And I'm like, "No, nope, it's like skinny jeans. I can't." Like, I, it's not me, like at all. It's not just a case of me being stubborn and being yeah. stuck in that kind of what I like. Like, I it is bit. I like what I like. I like baggy yeah. jeans and stuff like that but but it's just it's not me like and i'm short as well skinny jeans and short people they're just the work yeah, for me so <laughs> so yeah good, i'm just kind of i'm stuck in the 90s really in terms of my luck i'll still be probably in the same when i'm like 60 as well hey yeah, we're all different it's um yeah this is I, I like keeping up with uh you know you know all the different type of trends like there's there's a big trend the last few years and um uh there's a page dedicated to it on um it's all old football boys but it's called turn ups and turnouts and you know there's a big there's a there's a big thing for the old americana like 50s gear and um all all all, all army you know clothes and yeah uh, the, and japanese dead japanese denims and things like that it's been massive for the last probably 20 years you know it's uh it's, it's a whole new menswear culture now with the japanese and um the football boys really i think it it, it um uh it tails off a little bit but there but there you know but you know uh, what? yeah we're all different 
Yeah, everyone's got their own like little things they like, and I. Uh, do you know what though? My fa- out of all the coats I got, my favourite coat is like I really like my Stone Island bomber jacket, but that's just what it is. But I got this um, like a green park, uh, which I got from the Army Surplus Store in Germany. It's one of my favourite coats. Like I just because yeah, yeah. I like the like the look of it. Like, but... oh, definitely you can uh, you can get lucky every now and again like that, can't you? Right, yeah. I'll, I'll, before we go, Sam, um, we were talking. Um, you said you're getting lofty on, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I've been texting mm-hmm. back and forth and that. So, well, of all the stuff I've watched, watched lately, you know, you know, you box sets, films from like the Irishman, Anka Gems. Uh, curb, curb enthusiasm ten, which I was a little bit disappointed with at the end there, but I I, I love curb forever. Um, but for some reason, I've been watching a lot of classic East End. That's right. I never really used to watch it. I I, I knew you know I knew what was going on there, but but lately I think you know I think we're in this um uh we're in this digital generation now where people watch any shit, don't they? And now yeah. I'm watching classic EastEnders, and yeah. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if I miss Lofty because him, him and Michelle's quite early on it. Yeah, 80s, yeah, right? it was like yeah, yeah. I think I missed him because years. it's about it's about ninety three now. So um, yeah, I'll have to go back for Lofty. But, yeah, my uh, missus, yeah, the yeah. younger than me, she um, she didn't know who he was like, but he's been in a load of stuff. You know, loads of programs over the years. Yeah, Just big some... Arsenal fan, money. I remember he, yeah. he done he done quite a bit of football stuff. The um. Yeah, I think uh, he's been sure. on Soccer AM and that, you know, then the Rams. Yeah, and I'm sure there was it was a there was a program on BBC Two Deaf two years ago called Stand Room Only. Um, it was been like a, a pre fanzine football show. Um, yeah, it was quite cool. But I'm sure he, I'm sure you've done a few bits and pieces on there. Yeah, but yeah, I'm you know I'm just. Yeah, uh, we're just one day at a time now, isn't it, mate? You know, with all these. Uh, yeah, it's just trying to get on. through. Get through. Yeah, and, uh, I'm just wondering when, the, wondering when the barbers are going to open again because this fucking air, this um, I'd be ending up like uh, walking around the garden like Carlos Valderrama. Yeah, you can say you'll be catching up me soon. Yeah, yeah. With you, the old, you've got uh, a good, yeah. What? What? That, what's got that a good mop. Yeah, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know, man, man bun, I know. So, I mean, man but... bun, yeah, yeah, that's it. See, so basically, say, uh, you know, have you seen the? Um, I don't know if you would have you if you seen the show where I said why I got long hair now. So, basically, my youngest boy, he um, he wanted to grow his hair to donate to for people with cancer, where they make the wigs, and that. Yeah. So he wanted to grow out his hair, and then obviously you have a cut and you send it off to the charity, and they make it into wigs for kids or for people who've yeah. got cancer and they lose their hair. Um, so he'd got it like to a certain length; it wasn't long enough. So then he went to school. And some boys called called him a girl or made fun of him. Like, so he came home from school that day and was like, "No, nah, I want to cut. I want to cut." He wouldn't wouldn't let yeah, us talk yeah. him talk him out of it. So I said to him, "Right, okay." So we took him to get his hair cut. But he was really upset afterwards, then because obviously once you've had a cut, you've had a cut. Um, but he really wanted to do it. Like my mum uh, had cancer like a few years ago and stuff, so it's kind of like prevalent from that point of view. So she sorry to you, man. Sorry to you. Yeah. Well, luckily, you know, she got through it, and uh, she's s- still going strong. Good, good. So I said to him anyway. I said to him, uh, you know, I'll I'll grow my hair to donate. You tell me when to have it. When I cut it, you know, I'll keep growing it until you say. So that was over a year ago now. Um, my hair's like down here now. It's like right really? down to my down to my elbows. Yeah. Um, Fantastic, and I keep saying every now and again I'll say to him, "Right, we're gonna go and get, go and get a cat, like go and get it, you know, go and donate it." Not yet, Dad. And uh, at the moment, oh, yeah. at the moment, he said, "Ah, oh, you got to get it down to your waist, so you're like out of Guns and Roses or something like that." Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So it's very, but that's the story behind that. Fantastic, but it's for a good cause as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and but then I worry now is that a great cause. I worry now is that, like, with this virus going round, is I end up flipping getting that and uh, won't be able to do it. Br- but, yeah, brilliant. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's very noble of you and your son there. But <laughs> it's uh, getting a bit of a pain in the ass, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mind it. Like, like I got receding hairline, like so. I kind of look at it as yeah. like uh, it's my last big, my my last long hair before I end up shaving it all off and yeah, going yeah. bald. Very very but, quickly, um, yeah, mate. Because I yeah. forgot to do it earlier. Can I ask you those quick fire questions? All it is is ten ten questions. Quick fire questions with uh, with Lakey. All right, there we go. Brilliant. Uh, Stone Island or CP Company? No. Oh. The impossible. Yeah, the first one, Stone Island. Go on. Uh, Burberry or Aquascutan? Burberry. Uh, Oasis or the Beatles? Beatles. Oof. Liam or Noel? Liam. Uh, Noel we... no, no, sorry, Noel sold out a while ago. I know it's only quick fire questions, but yeah, uh, no, I, had right. to, I had to get that one in. Go on. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Bowie or Jagger? Good uh, Bowie. Uh, Gigs or Bale? Bale. Uh, Warnock or Dave Jones? Oh, Cruel. Cruel. Warnock. Uh, Messi or Ronaldo? Messi. Maradona or Pele? Diego. Yeah, shout. Uh, Ramsey or Bellamy to finish off? Aaron. That's a hard, that's a hard one, that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Aaron, because, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's a bit of a, a nicer guy than Craig, I think, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what was okay, the one before uh, that? Now? What was the one before that? No, we talked about Maradona, I think. Um, when we got more time next time, we'll uh, we'll have a chat about do we see his documentary? Documentary, yeah, yeah. I I watched it day before yesterday. Actually, yeah, we'll have a chat about that next time. Uh, next time you come on, yeah, yeah. What a what a gold like somebody somebody summed it up better than me the other day. A gold fish bowl of lunacy. <laughs> Fucking mental, crazy, it, mate. Isn't it? Great. Um, he proved. I think he proved to uh, everyone who who the governor was. Oh yeah, and and it was interesting to watch it to see that some of his issues perhaps weren't initially you know to start with caused by him necessarily seemed no, to no. me anyway a little bit like he got kind of not tricked but the the people he was hanging around with were quite eager to get him shoving stuff up his nose so that they yeah, could put no, it, get him into was, a compromising uh, position like yeah um yeah let's just say he was uh he was a uh, <laughs> In the in the right place at the wrong time, I think, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, <laughs> tell the people where they can find you on Twitter or Instagram or what not. Yeah, find me on. I'm Anthony Rivers on Facebook, on Twitter. I'm Tony Rivers nineteen twenty seven, and uh, follow us at the Archive Zero nine two seven on Instagram for lots of old photos and comments. Excellent. Beautiful. And thank um, you, Sam. No worries, mate. Thank you for joining me. Guys, you can find me at youtube.com slash ace podcast nation and uh, all the usual audio apps. Twitter at acecast underscore nation and facebook.com slash acecast nation. Join us. Thanks uh, for the invite, Sam. No worries, mate. I appreciate your time. Thank and you. uh, we'll see you all for the next episode.